Uh, good morning. If I could encourage everybody to take their seats, we're going to go ahead and get this next session started. And just to demonstrate that the brightest minds are from the Tri-Cities, we have an all-Tri-Cities panel today, starting with our state treasurer, Davidson, originally out of the Tri-Cities, Senator Sharon Brown out of the Tri-Cities, and I am Jason Mercy, the government reform director from the Tri-Cities, so you'll notice a trend here. Now, Washington is known for many things. When you talk about Washington State, you're going to talk about apples, you're going to talk about wine, you're going to talk about Boeing, aerospace. There's something else that we're known for. Let me give you a little personal story. When I was in Disneyland last year, waiting in line, the family next to us said, oh, where are you from? I said, Washington State. And when I said that, the dad's eyes got really wide. And he said, hey, that's the state without an income tax, right? And he turns to his wife, that would be fantastic. It is fantastic. It's a competitive advantage for the state of Washington. Now, don't take our word for that. That is what the State Department of Commerce says. This is the state's institution charged with advertising Washington to employers across the world. They say, come to Washington. You will be at a competitive advantage because we have no income tax. Our speakers today are going to talk about the importance of that competitive advantage and some of the things that occurred this past session. But before we get to that, there's some good news. We survived this year without an income tax. You may be asking yourself, what income tax? I never heard about that. We got a couple of videos to demonstrate what was in play. A capital gains tax is an income tax. How do we know? Washington Policy Center asked the revenue departments of each state how each taxed capital gains. Every single state that taxed capital gains taxed them as income. States that did not tax capital gains did not because they did not tax income. For example, Florida described their treatment of capital gains income like this. There is currently no Florida income tax for individuals, and therefore no Florida capital gains tax for individuals. Washington State Congressman Dan Newhouse asked for clarification on capital gains taxes from the Internal Revenue Service. In a letter, the IRS responded saying, you ask whether tax on capital gains is considered an excise tax or an income tax. It is an income tax. More specifically, capital gains are treated as income under the tax code and taxed as such. Every state in the union treats capital gains taxes as an income tax, and the IRS defines capital gains tax as an income tax. Yet in Washington state, advocates of capital gains income tax refuse to call it an income tax. Why? Perhaps it's because voters have turned down income taxes 10 times at the ballot box. And a graduated tax on any income would require an amendment to the Washington state constitution. This has long been recognized as the law. Indeed, voters have repeatedly rejected constitutional amendments to implement an income tax and other efforts to implement it in 1934, 36, 38, 42, 44, 70, 73, 75, 82, and 2010. Either way, Washington deserves an honest debate about taxes. Those who want income taxes should say so and work to amend the state constitution if they want a graduated income tax. On one thing, there should be no debate. As the IRS has made clear, a capital gains tax is an income tax. Help us keep Washington state income tax-free. Join us at WashingtonPolicy.org. Okay, so let's, let's take score here. Every state in the country, a capital gains tax is an income tax. The Internal Revenue Service, that little agency in the federal government that's charged with tax policy, a capital gains tax is an income tax. The actual text of the bills in the legislature to impose this capital gains tax, what does it call it? An income tax. So why this game? Why the refusal to call it what it is? We saw that little projection of the 10 times the voters have rejected an income tax, including six constitutional amendments. So the fact that those of us in this room are not cooperating means that those that want an income tax have to figure out, well, we're striking out with 7 million Washingtonians. Let's try our luck with five judges. Let's pass a tax that we know is illegal. We know we will be sued. And let's see if we can get the state Supreme Court to allow an income tax without a constitutional amendment. 
That's what was in play this session. That's what this is all about. And if this sounds familiar, this is exactly what the city of Seattle tried to do a few years ago. On a unanimous vote, the city council passed a city-only income tax. Not only is that against state law, it's against the Constitution. We asked ourselves, well, why are they doing this? So we actually, for the first time in the history of the Policy Center, filed a lawsuit. We filed a public records lawsuit against the city of Seattle for a copy of a 2014 legal memo that the city attorney provided to the city council to figure out what were they being told and why they did this. And to our surprise, Seattle settled that lawsuit with us. It paid all our attorney fees, it didn't want to go to court, and it gave us that memo. What do you think Seattle's own attorney told the city council? This is against state law, it's against the Constitution, this is illegal, you can't do this. They did it anyway, and we found out through other public records they did so because they wanted to set up this lawsuit. Regardless of whether an income tax is legal, is it good policy? So we have another video on that. An income tax on capital gains in Washington state is a bad idea that would reduce our competitiveness, cause budget instability, and create political pressure for future tax increases. Here's why. Capital gains taxes are extremely volatile. California's Legislative Budget Office described the capital gains tax revenue as a roller coaster of revenue volatility. Governor Jerry Brown drove that point home to California voters, and as you can see in the chart here, the ups and downs of capital gains revenue actually look like a roller coaster. Ultimately, California voters approved a constitutional amendment to restrict the use of revenues from capital gains for state spending. The volatility of revenue from income taxes on capital gains is widely recognized. Even Washington State's Department of Revenue has recognized this fact. In 2012, they warned capital gains are extremely volatile from year to year and cautioned revenues would depend entirely on fluctuations in the financial markets. This would create enormous political pressure to increase or expand other taxes to make up for the inevitable revenue shortfalls in bad times. Once implemented, these additional taxes would be unlikely to be repealed, leading to creeping permanent tax increases. Implementing a capital gains tax would also strip Washington of one of its most recognized competitive advantages, the fact it does not have an income tax. The State Department of Commerce says this is not only a competitive advantage, but also great marketing for Washington. Introducing an income tax of any kind in Washington State is bad policy. An income tax on capital gains is no exception. Let's make sure we never have an income tax in Washington State. Join us at WashingtonPolicy.org. So great marketing reminds me of the dad at Disneyland who got all excited when he found out where I was from. That is what we're known from. That's our competitive advantage. Now, I might have had a little bit too much fun when I testified this year before the legislature because when I was trying to explain this, I called to the stand my top witness, California Governor Jerry Brown and showed that slide. For, for some reason, they forgot about that by the time they voted on it. But if California can figure this out, we can figure this out. So illegal and bad policy, what does that have to do with Washington's competitive advantage of not having income tax? What does that mean? Well, now we're going to turn to our all-star Tri-Cities panel. We're going to let them each go and go to your Q&A. But I think the person most effective at communicating this message on why it would be bad policy, why it would impact the state's competitiveness, is our state treasurer, Dwayne Davidson, who is tasked with keeping the fiscal health of the state paramount in his daily activities. Mr. Treasurer, you can come to the podium, speak from there, wherever you're more comfortable. Please join me in welcoming Treasurer Davidson. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me uh, here today to talk about this important issue. I first want to start with just telling you just a little bit of history about me and this uh, concept about an income tax. Uh, I was a, a, the Benton County Treasurer uh, for uh, four terms uh, before running for state uh, treasurer and uh, never gave income tax much thought uh, except uh, just generally speaking, a person is against uh, <laughs> taxes and any new taxes, that's for sure. And when I uh, was running for state treasurer, this concept of a state income tax became almost like the forefront of the uh, of the election and especially due to the fact that it, it wound up in a very peculiar way that we had two Republicans in the general 
and uh, one of us took the stance that uh, they would explore the opportunity, and I took the stance that the uh, the, the the present uh, the, the current uh, treasurer at the time, Jim McIntyre, a Democrat, had advocated for a state income tax to to get us out of what we refer to as a McCleary mess. It was a state income tax that would be totally dedicated to school funding, and it didn't get much uh, audience, even though he was a former legislator. Uh, nobody really paid attention to it. In fact, when I uh, came to office, there was boxes and boxes and boxes of beautiful little brochures with this garbage about a state income tax on it, and thousands of them. I sent them all to Shredder. That was the only, only moment in my life that I ever really uh, did mass censorship of something. But I, <laughs> but I sent those all to the, uh, uh, and, and I told the person that delivered them down to the shredder, I said, stay there and, and uh, witness that they actually get shredded, would you please? And they did. But uh, I, took the, I took the stance that I thought that the treasurer's office should not be involved in uh, the debate of public policy to that degree. Uh, that's more the legislature. I saw the treasurer's role as providing financial information for the, uh, uh, for the um, uh, estate and for the state legislature and should be more neutral about issues. So I took kind of an approach that I didn't think the treasurer's office should be engaged in that and that was wrong. And that, obviously, that settled well with the majority of the voters. I have, however, taken a more aggressive stance about income tax as I've gone on because I actually do have a policy statement on it from the treasurer's office because after coming to office and studying this issue more, I realized just how uh, uh, critical it is to our incredible economic success that we have here in this uh, state is one of the, uh, is the major reason is that we don't have a state income tax. You hear over and over and over again, and uh, Senator Brown can uh, attest to this, legislators continue talking about this unfair tax system that we have, and we need these studies to, to, to look at ways to reform our tax system in Washington State because it's just so unfair for uh, the poor and it's so regressive. And you know, you don't want to buy that because that's not what the objective here is all. The, the objective of a state income tax is not to try to make things more fair, it's for additional revenue, period. I mean, that's what it is, it's for additional revenue. They show their cards all the time. They showed it when we did the McCleary fix. They did the McCleary fix, we thought that they didn't even allow that to even totally unfold before now they're levy, allowing districts levy lifts and things to, addition, to create additional revenue. And you said, well, is that going to get us right back into the situation that we had before with the Supreme Court? And they can't answer that fundamental question. I've listened over and over and over again to that question being asked to legislators that were for this. And over and over again, the, here, here's what the common response I've heard. Oh, it's going to go for very specific purposes, and the state auditor is going to audit those funds. Oh, wow, what a novel concept. The state auditor is going to be auditing state funds. I mean, that, that's been around since statehood. I mean, that's just a ridiculous, ridiculous idea. So the talk about fairness of uh, the uh, state income tax is, uh, that's, that's a no-brainer, and especially due to the fact that so many states that have an income tax have a sales tax also. I want to just right now, because I'm really, really fond of history, I want to just uh, 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 talk to you guys just about a little example of something about progressive ideas. I'm going to tie in another little concept that's being debated about right now in Olympia in a very big way. How many here uh, know uh, the, the name Gray Davis? Anybody remember Gray Davis? Uh, recalled uh, governor of, of uh, California? Uh, uh, I don't want to talk about him. Uh, uh, he, was a, he was a second governor uh, to, be, uh, to be recalled for uh, second governor in, this, in the history of the nation to be recalled. Here's where my story begins. You know who the first one was? The first one was a Republican by the name of Lynn Frazier. And he was, uh, uh, talk about popular, this guy got 79% of the vote in North Dakota about 1910-ish, 79%, very progressive Republican. We all know that progressive era that was back then. Very, very, very progressive. He had two major 
uh, um, uh, ideas that he wanted to implement, and he was successful in both of them. One of them was for North Dakota to get an income tax, and they have it to this day. The other one was another very progressive uh, topic that's not the topic of the day, but I'll just mention it because it's being talked about a lot in Olympia, and that's formation of a state bank. Because we know how well the state runs their industries, and so just running a state bank would just be, you know, let's just give them all the money and see if they can run that as well as they do the ferry system. So, so both of them are terrible ideas, and he was recalled after making 79%, but his ideas remained. And they're still there today. The, these concepts were developed. They're still the rule of the law in North Dakota. So I just thought when I was outside researching a few things on my phone before I came in here, I didn't even think before in preparation for my sp speech to you today until looking up this today, what is North Dakota sales tax rates? Well, just like in Washington State, they vary between municipality, between local jurisdictions, because they can put their additional amount on top of the state uh, 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 the state sales tax, there are some communities that are paying 8% sales tax, and they have income tax, and they have property tax. So people that talk to you about equitable tax treatment for all citizens, that's hogwash. This is all about additional revenue. That's what it's about. And, uh, uh, and capital gains is where they're going first. They say, we're not talking about income tax, we're talking about capital gains. There's no, I'm a CPA, I'm still a CPA. There's no, capital gains is an income tax, okay? It's clearly an income tax. But here's what's more important. They will have the apparatus in place if they do get a capital gains tax. Just think of it. They're gonna have the apparatus in place that that next step to an income tax is gonna be just adding a couple thousand more FTEs because that's what's gonna be required. Every time we pass legislation, I'm amazed about, in this session, how we did the short-term disability and, uh, and or no, long-term disability and the uh, uh, short-term leave act. And every piece of this legislature, legislation that comes through, my immediate response as state treasurer is I'm diving in to see how much this is gonna cost to implement. I'm looking for the fiscal notes. And sometimes it's passed off the floor before the fiscal notes even done. They don't even know what this is gonna cost. You don't do anything in Olympia without a whole lot of people. And how many people do you think will need to employ if they put in this capital gains tax? It's gonna be massive. And the next step, if they go to income tax, I'm talking about thousands of employees. Because we know they wouldn't do it the simple way where they just say a certain percentage of the, age, uh, the adjusted gross income at the federal level and that's it. Maybe they could get by with two or 3,000 employees if they kept it that simple, but we live in Washington State, we're, so we're gonna have to have some kind of exemption for if you ride to work on a scooter or if you don't use plastic straws or something. We're gonna have to come up with some unique tax code so that we can uh, uh, do all of our social agenda work, right? That's how the state operates. So I used to be basically thinking that this just is something the treasurer's office ought to not take a stance on. Now I can see just how crippling it is because guess what? We are a economic powerhouse. And when you look at the other states that don't have a state income tax, they're the same way, Florida and Texas and Alaska. They say, well, that's not proof. That's, <laughs> that, but it sounds pretty good to me. Is all the states that don't have an income tax are the states that are prospering so well right now. And the video, I think this is a really important because capital gains is gonna be up for major discussion again next year. And the video that Jason showed made a very interesting point that I wanna really point out to you. They always tried to put a little gimmick to make it sound like an easy sale. And one of the things that was talked about this year is if they pass a capital gains tax, they will make sure it is uh, dedicated to like the capital projects fund or something. They're gonna specify one purpose of that fund and say, we're only gonna use it for just this and that will make it more palatable. And to the average voter, they think, oh, okay, well, at least they're restricting it. Well, we don't do capital projects without bonding. And I can tell you the bond market knows capital gains is an extremely volatile income stream because people have some discretion about whether they're going to exercise their capital gains if they do the sale or not. 
That makes it a very, very, very volatile income stream. And the bond market doesn't like volatile income streams. If you put that up as a pledge, they are going to reciprocate with, a, uh, with an interest rate that's going to be for the risk that they're taking. So that is not a good sale. I will be very, very vocal about that if Treasurer, if they are offering that as an example next year when I know this capital gains discussion is going to be coming back. So I think I've about allotted up my time. I'll uh, turn it over to the good uh, senator. But uh, uh, um, basically, my position now is a little bit different than it first started. I think that we have something here to really protect. And I really want to caution you guys, because like the state bank issue, there once was a time when people just dismissed that so easily and said, you know, th th that's not going to happen. It's constitutional. They don't care about the Constitution. They passed a bank tax that didn't even go through proper committee that, uh, because I have to deal with the big banks. You know, that's who we, I have the state's money with, is the big largest banks. They passed a bank tax in the last day of the session that they said was a slight increase because it was 1%. What they failed to remind, it would tell everybody is a, the rate was approximately 1% to begin with, so that was doubling the tax, but it's, what a unique concept of a slight increase, it double the tax. And it's only on the major banks. Well, that's as unfair. That just shows you about all their talk about being equitable. That is just an attack on private industry, attack on the, uh, the profitable businesses. And like I've told several legislators, congratulations, there goes bank fees for Washington State. Because a bank is gonna turn right around and recoup those from us. So, I'm getting kind of worked up. I think I better turn it over, so. I really wish we had a treasurer with more passion on these topics. Before introducing Senator Brown, I wanted to emphasize something that the treasurer said about the, the bond rating for the state of Washington. Right, one of the arguments beyond we need a fair tax is we need a sustainable and dependable tax. So if you think about taxes on a scale of volatility, your more stable taxes are your property, gross receipts, and sales. What do we have? That's our three-legged stool. That's why when you look at our balance sheet, you see a, an increase that goes like this. As you continue down that scale of volatility, personal income starts to get pretty volatile, corporate income gets really volatile, capital gains is that absolute roller coaster. So if your goal is predictable, sustainable funding, you don't go for volatility. And that's something we're going to want to keep in mind. And speaking of volatility, it was a fairly volatile session on taxes, Senator Brown, who had a front row seat being in the Ways and Means Committee, getting to see all of this come through. And beyond the income tax, we won on that. Unfortunately, not so, more, so much so on some of the other taxes. And we'll let Senator Brown come up and uh, give us some of the input on that. So please join me in welcoming Senator Brown. Thank you, Jason and Dwayne. It's so great to have you here. Well, join me, everybody, as we go into the carnival that was last session. I've got a small PowerPoint here, and we will go through some of the uh, interesting things through that carnival. You'll see some flying monkeys and stuff through here, I'm sure, because welcome to Taxapalooza. As we enter the tent, we have the Democrat proposed tax increases. We had the income tax on capital gains, as we've talked about, higher property taxes, 70% higher gas taxes, higher heating costs, 67% increase in B&O taxes, higher insurance premiums, payroll tax, graduated real estate excise tax, also known as REIT, higher ferry rates, higher vehicle registration fees, bank tax, this one is perplexing though, bicycle tax, and more. And this is all, let me frame this up, this is in a year when we had almost four billion additional dollars above and beyond what is required for our maintenance levels. The Democrats increased spending by 18%, and with current revenue we can afford to increase tax state spending by 14% without raising taxes. We did not need to raise taxes. 
So here's the 2019 session tax increases. This was the end result. We now have a payroll tax, a property tax, a BNO services tax, a graduated read, a banks, a MACA, international investment services, non-residents, travel agents, and look at those totals. It's an incredible, incredible amount of revenue that was generated in a year when we did not need to have any tax increases at all. That's what I think of that, throw that away. <laughs> As we've talked about so much so far today, I'm going to reiterate, a capital gains is an income tax. Washington voters have rejected an income tax. I said nine times, Jason corrected me, ten times. Uh, the bill was entitled, and I quote, increasing revenues for the support of state government. Well, if you continue to have a need to grow state government, I guess you've got to figure out how you're going to pay for it. It did not make it out of committee. The House attempted to add capital gains tax to its budget, and I will caution, this is going to be a fight in 2020. This fight, this is not over. We do have a payroll tax. It was House Bill 1087. It establishes the Long-Term Services and Supports Trust Program to provide benefits for long-term services and supports to qualified individuals who need assistance with at least three activities of daily living. The premium is right there. It's approximately $290 annually on a $50,000 income. The benefit could purchase $100 a day of daycare for a year in one's own home. However, existing senior citizens do not qualify, and this is the most important part of it, one of the most important parts of this terrible piece of legislation, is that there is a $36,500 lifetime maximum payout. Lifetime maximum. So anybody who's dealt with long-term care, with parents, et cetera, knows that that's gonna be gone probably in one year. So yes, one year. All right, property taxes. So under Senate, Senate control, majority uh, control last uh, two years ago, we actually decreased property taxes for 73% of the state. However, Senate Bill 5313 is raising the cap on local levy lip, uh, rates. The current levy rate that we had set was $1.50 per $1,000 valuation of home. Under this bill, it's now 250. So for sake of discussion, Spokane School District on a $200,000 home, it's gonna create $300 in local school taxes. And the impact of this bill is a 67% rate increase. Let me reiterate that, a 67% rate increase. Oh, here's another one, guys. B&O services tax increases. 945 million business and occupation tax increase over four years, three billion plus after 10 years. So to the two speakers who went before me, I wanna reiterate that this is just the continuation of a slush fund. This is just making pockets of additional revenue so that they can fund all of their pet projects. There's a 20% B&O surcharge on income from services and other activities of select businesses. 33.33% B&O surcharge on income from service and other activities with revenue in excess of 25 billion. And 6666 for businesses with revenue in excess of 100 billion. Approximately 88,000 small businesses in Washington state would be affected by this legislation. And you hear them talk time and time again about, oh, we're just going after the really, really wealthy corporations and the really wealthy individuals in this state. The facts prove them absolutely wrong. This is gonna hurt 88,000 small businesses in Washington state. Here we go, the graduated REIT. This is projected to bring in 600 million over four years. And again, these are not dedicated funds. These, this is $600 million that certain public interest groups are gonna have to spend. The rates apply to values within category. It's gonna be 1.1% rate on sales below 500, 1.28% on a rate for sales above 500 to 1.5, 
2.75% rate for sales greater than 1.5 to 3 million, and a 3% rate for sales greater than 3 million. And so, ironically, and I'm pretty sure they didn't really flush out the numbers, this gives individuals with expensive homes a tax break, but it's penalizing owners of large apartment buildings and ultimately will result in higher rents for already struggling tenants. And as much as we tried to point this out to them on the floor through four amendments, et cetera, they didn't care, they were going for the dough. And then we have the Model Toxic Control Program, the MOTCA tax. The current law was 0.7% tax on wholesale value of hazardous substances. Most of the revenues are derived from petroleum products, so this really is going to hit our refineries in the state. Uh, the original proposal was 2.5 per barrel instead of the current law, which is 0.7%. Um, growth by a fiscal growth factor, so projected to generate just shy of one billion a biennia. The Frock Striker took it down to a dollar, not that this is any better, marginally better, a dollar thirty-nine per barrel tax. We already have the highest barrel tax in the entire country. The growth by the implicit implicit price deflator generates just shy of three hundred and sixty million in new revenues over four years. The quote unquote revenue neutral rate would be roughly 70 cents a barrel. So the striker is in effect a doubling of the tax. It's going to absolutely cripple our petroleum industry. Then we have the B&O tax rate on international investment management services. This reauthorizes and expands the sales and use tax exemption of the purchase of standard financial information by qualifying investment management companies and their affiliates, but it modifies the qualifications for international investment management services B&O preferential tax rate. The DOR fiscal note indicates roughly 60 million a biennia. These these numbers are absolutely staggering. Oh, gosh, and they just keep coming. Like I said, we're going through the tent. The monkeys are starting to fly. The clean energy tax adds more than $35 per month to household electric bills. Uncertain of the exact number over all utilities, but one major utility ran the numbers and determined it will cost at least $35 per month to their customers. In spite of our floor amendments and trying to point out that this is going to help uh, people who are really struggling to decide if they're going to be able to refill their medications or keep the heat on, this is not about helping people. This is about putting money aside to use at a later date for special interest groups. We now have a 100% clean standard by January 1, 2045. Each electric utility must meet 100% of its retail electric load to Washington customers using non-emitting electric generation and electricity from renewable resources. And there is a little bit of irony in this, especially for those of us from Eastern Washington. In the Tri-Cities, the Benton um, Public Utility District actually has 96% clean energy that it already produces. However, Puget Sound Energy purchases almost 40% carbon emitting resources. So how's that for a little bit of irony? We gotta take the, the smiles where we can get them. Tax preferences, non-resident sales tax exemptions converted to remittance. The expected revenue is 54 million over two years, $113 million over four years, 327 million over 10 years. The B&O rate for travel agents changed from 0.275% to 0.9% services rate, and the expected revenue from that is five million over two years, 11 over four, and $32 million over 10 years. Just keeps coming, people. So the proposed bills that may carry over to 2020 is uh, Senate Bill 5129, increasing revenues for support of state government. <laughs> Guess who proposed this gem? The governor <laughs> proposes a 67% B&O services rate increase. The results 
in, would be 2.6 billion in 2019-21, 3.1 billion dollars in 2021 to 23, and would affect over 175,000 businesses throughout the state of Washington. There was also Senate Bill 5293, which was a proposed home energy efficiency tax, and they could add at least $6,000 to $12,000 to the cost of new homes. One of the things that we pride ourselves on in Eastern Washington especially is home affordability. Not gonna have it anymore if we get this. Some more proposed bills that can carry over are Senate Bill 5971, which would be a 1% tax on the sale of new bicycles, which I don't know why they've got it out for new bicycles, but even electric bikes, whatever. The wood stove tax, $20 on the purchase of wood stoves. And fire suppression and prevention, and this would really increase the cost of homeowners and vehicles insurance. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And that's it so far. To be continued next session. You know, in retrospect, we should have just listed the taxes that weren't increased this session to save some time. Before we get to our Q&A, I just wanted to point out something curious happened on these tax increases that hasn't happened in my 20 years of following the legislature. The Constitution allows all of us to play the role of governor. We can veto any bill the legislature and the governor signs with a referendum, with the exception of bills that have an emergency clause. For some reason, the majority of these tax increases, maybe it's because they rushed so quickly in the final days of session, did not include the emergency clauses. So the BNO on the banks, the BNO on the professional services, the graduated real estate excise tax, and the vaping tax, there's no emergency clauses on those four bills. And if the Washingtonians are so inclined, would be subject to referendum. So we'll just throw that out there. And we do have some mics, so if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the mic to get to you. We'll get to you next there. What do they do with what they already take? Where's the accountability? I just, I, I'm, I'm baffled by the fact that they, there's so much increase in taxes and there's still potholes. There's no north-south freeway. What's going on there? So that's part of the problem, that these are not dedicated resources, although they'll lead you to believe that they are. And as the treasurer pointed out earlier, we do most of our major improvements in this state through bonding capacity not through generating revenue like what they propose here. And something else that I forgot to mention during the course of the presentation, which I really want to bring to light, is the darkness within which these bills were passed. Most of these bills we didn't even start to debate until 10.30 at night. And then I looked over toward the press pool. It was around, I don't know, probably 1 o'clock, because a couple nights we went all through the night and there was actually no press available at all. I'm sure they were all listening at home on TVW, but nobody there was there present to see the volley between us and the other side, to see how we tried to stand up for people all across the state of Washington. It was all done under the cover of darkness. A, a, a side note, um, can we hold Inslee accountable and maybe audit him for some of this stuff? Is that possible? Just a hypothetical. It's possible to get a new governor. What, I, I would like to expand on just a little bit about that uh, in uh, the, uh, the last hour uh, movement. I think one particular person ought to be, uh, did you show how frustrated people were getting is a, a moderate Democrat from, uh, he's from the Isquah area, uh, 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 Senator Mullet, it, uh, was very objectionable to the, uh, because I think he chairs the committee that that legislation was supposed to go through that they totally bypassed and he stood up very gallantly every single time our Senator, uh, 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 Senator Short uh, did eight amendments to that uh, bank tax bill. He seconded uh, those objections and uh, called for a, a no vote or a yes vote to the amendments. So it was even upsetting some in their own camp. 
Before we get to the next question, just to continue on that point. So Senator Mullet, the chair of the Democratic Senate Financial Committee, basically responsible for financial institutions. It's a 105-day session. This brand new tax on the bank showed up on day 103 with this detail. A title-only bill, blank bill, that was then stripped, voted on, and approved by the legislature in the span of 24 hours, voting at 2 in the morning. So when he gave his floor speech, his comments were, I'm the chair of this committee. We have not vetted this policy. We have no impact, no idea what the impact's going to be on our commerce, our bank fees, our home loans. I can't even get a legal analysis from the Attorney General's office because it's late Saturday morning and they're not there to answer my texts. So we have no legal review. Again, this is the Democratic chair of the Finance Committee objecting to this that passed on a one-vote margin. And something else about that bank tax is that we had a very robust debate on the Senate floor because we talked about, they kept trying to say, this is only going to affect the biggest banks and why don't we want to have additional taxes on the biggest banks? Most of us in this room, because we're talking about taxes, understand financials, understand the financial industry. Most of our local banks are required to participate out their loans with bigger banks because they have loan to value ratios. This is going to impact every bank throughout the state of Washington. So we'll go here and then over to the side here. So first off, uh, Senator Brown, thank you for being Senator Sharon Brown and not the former Senator Brown. Um, <laughs> I'm happy about that too. Yeah, but uh, you, and you were kind of stepping on some of my points there, but very, very well put. You know, they're, they're introducing this stuff in the last 48 hours of a, of a 2400 hour session. They're introducing blank, uh, you know, title only bills. They're, um, we've got Frank Chop, who I understand is retiring, um, thank God. Um, but is just gaveling this stuff through, and I'm sure there's somebody else who's going to be right behind him that's just going to be gaveling this stuff through without debate, you know, shouting people down who oppose. Uh, as, a, as a taxpayer, I am ridiculously frustrated that this stuff is being just railroaded. You know, and, and then they throw on on top of that the emergency, the emergency clause, so it, it strips us of all the power. How, how do we, as, as ordinary citizens, I mean, outside of revolution in, inside the state, so you need to take your frustrations out on social media because despite our best efforts, the news will not report on these things that are happening. So we need you guys to brush up, get your kids involved or whatever, and help get you on social media and help spread the word that these tax increases are impacting every single Washingtonian across the state. This is not just taxes on big banks. This is not just a real estate excise tax that's going to impact people that have really expensive properties. We need to get the facts out because they're not talking the facts. We need to talk the facts, but we need to spread it across the state. I, I would like to just expand a little bit too on uh, the, the Senator's uh, uh, excellent PowerPoint there where she was describing some of the taxes and how what the projected revenue over time is going to be as the finance guy and looking at these numbers the one thing i'd like to point out to the crowd is that uh they really expect some of these revenues to go out in the six years what they said i'm just going to draw a couple you keep increasing uh b and o taxes at the rate that they want to business are just going to be forced out of business and there's no tax then and and one i can really draw some attention to because it's from my hometown our hometown three cities the sales tax exemption um they're really banking on that for, uh, I forget what the exact number is, it's about 30 54, million. 54. 54 first, first year. That's not gonna continue forever because, you know, in the Tri-Cities, and the Senator will vouch for me, on a Saturday morning, you go down to our mall, and one third of the cars there were Oregon residences because the Tri-Cities, just as Vancouver is, was a major shopping center for uh, the Oregon residents. You take away their sales tax exemption, they're gonna build their own stores. And that's going to happen really rather quickly, and then we won't get any of that. But they don't think that. On the that flip financial. side, though, the mall at Christmas time might be a little more bearable now. About the <laughs> I, think, I think we have like a question over the mall. <laughs> uh, while we're waiting for this question here, back to your transparency, there is something that can be done, but it's a catch-22. Okay, the Constitution allows the legislature to set its own rules, which makes it hard to impose transparency requirements via an initiative. If the legislature imposes it on itself, however, that can occur. There's the catch-22. But there is a bill from 2014, the Senate Bill 6560. Senator Patton was one of the sponsors of it. It would ban title-only bills. 
It would require transparency on the things they called strikers and substitutes and make bills sit at least 24 hours before final passage. So we can encourage our lawmakers to support that to try to put those restrictions in place. Treasurer Davidson, could you please give us a few comments about the idea of a state bank? Oh, uh, a few, huh? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I encourage everybody to go out to uh, the state treasurer's website and you'll find, I'm gonna answer your question, but there is a wealth of knowledge on, on this. My staff has done a great job. Uh, we took a look at this, the concept about a state bank has been looked at by about uh, 10 states and about uh, six entities, uh, uh, meaning cities, uh, in recent time, at great public expense. Not our, but each one of these communities have put a lot of money into this concept about state bank. Each and every time, they have come back to be negative. I'll tell you just a little bit real quickly. How much time? You're good. Real, real quickly, when I first became uh, treasurer, in the couple months the legislature gave, not, you know, the majority gave me a, uh, a study, gave me $75,000 to study the concept about a state bank. I took it, I brought experts in, I avoided active debate so nobody could say I was being biased. I brought the experts in, I thought it was an extremely well done uh, study. We spent 37000 of the $75,000, so we only spent half the budget, and we gave our report to the legislature and they said, we don't like that, wrong answer, because our answer was don't do a state bank. So the very next year, they appropriated $480,000 and gave it to the governor's office to study the same idea. Because we don't want to give it to the treasurer because he doesn't know what he's talking about, evidently. The governor knows more about banks than the treasurer. So, so uh, they gave it to the governor. The governor now has given it to the uh, Evans School of Public Policy. They, have, they blew the budget and they needed additional money this year to complete the study, which is going to be coming out in June. The idea of a state bank horrifies me. And it horrifies me because I've got a libertarian streak to me, and it upsets me when I hear that even sometimes some libertarians talk about this idea about you know, keeping the money in, within government, paying ourselves the interest. The problem is we put pu our public dollars at great risk in doing that. It takes a lot of money to start a bank, and there's only two pox pockets of money at the, at the state. I know where they are. Number one is about the $18 billion that we've got in the local government investment pool that is municipalities throughout the city of Washington, including the city of Spokane and Spokane counties, excess cash that they need on a short-term basis. So that's other people's money, so that should put that off limits. And the other is the state pension funds. That's $100 billion. And if they start loaning that out, because if they blow that money, the pensions don't go away. The pension obligation is still going to be there and it's going to be picked up by the taxpayers. That's why we got to protect that, that pension money. We have, we do some things in the state well, and one of the things we do is we have a well-ran pension system, about 85% funded. I wish it was 100, but come on, we're a lot better than Illinois and New Jersey. That's about 28%. We could be a lot worse. We got a very good pension system. Let's not put all that money at risk. I ask them, what do you want to make loans for that are not currently being done? One of the ideas I got from a very prominent Democratic legislator is they wanted to explore the opportunity to student loans in Washington State. One and a half trillion dollars of student loan debt now, a major portion of this default. Yeah, sign me up for that. Pro yeah, I want to put state investments for there. I do have to tell you, Treasurer, I still have nightmares from that meeting when you told me they wanted to capitalize the bank with the pension funds. I just cannot believe they, it. They say it every day in their literature. It's not me making it up, and it's in their literature. It's in their radio broadcasts that they do. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling. It really is. I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Any other questions? Nobody wants to jump in on this good news? Oh, no, no. Anybody else? All right, back up front here. Uh, Senator Brown, again, thank you for not being Lisa. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you talked about, you talked about the, uh, the slush funds that, they, that, that our, our legislature is creating. And what I'm seeing, you, know, you, you, you talked about how they're you know, adding, uh, adding all these things and what, that are driving up the cost for ordinary people. And, and, I, and, I, and I think it's going to be a self-fulfilling kind of thing where they're going to be creating the problems and then they're going to be swooping in 
with the solutions, and I find that ridiculously disingenuous. And again, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, Washington Policy does a good job of bringing that stuff out, but I'm not sure that, that, that we can respond fast enough, can we? It all gets back to majorities. <laughs> it depends on who has the majority, who is in the governor's office. Um, I can't reiterate enough. I need every single one of you people to get out there and get on social media or even call your local news people and talk about some of the stuff that's going on. Because a lot of people, I came back home from session, talked to some of my neighbors, they had no idea of, of what had happened in the dark hours of the night in Olympia. Did we have one more question? Okay, this will be our last question. Thanks, Senator Brown. The, uh, based on the comment that you're making, I'd like to follow on, as well as what the gentleman was saying up forward. Two of the major players on that are in our community here that we vote for. Senator Anna Billing, who leads the Senate, and Representative Tim Ormsby, who's the head of the Budget Committee. So you want to make a change, remove them. Thank you. Okay. So we had this session started talking about Washington's renowned competitive advantage of no income taxes, why that's important, why we want to maintain that. We have a favor to ask of you. We've produced these videos. They're very shareable on social media. We know, as the Senator and the Treasurer said, this is coming back next session. How do we know? The budget adopted included $2 million for the Department of Revenue to oversee a tax structure study. And what do you think one of the things they are supposed to recommend is? An income tax. That's going to be coming back, reported to the legislature this winter for their session going into next year. So we would encourage you to share these videos, share about why it's a competitive advantage, why we want to maintain that, why an income tax is the wrong direction for the state of Washington. And those of you in Spokane are going to have a chance, potentially this fall, to be the anti-Seattle. As a charter city, there is a charter, member, uh, charter amendment being proposed that would put into Spokane's charter that there can never be an income tax. Now, even though that's currently against state law and the Constitution, if for some reason our Supreme Court goes wild and overturns state precedent, those floodgates will be open. It will be up to, up to cities to decide how they want to position that debate. To be. So for now, before I dismiss you to go over to our lunch, which will be starting at noon, you're going to get a, a good 10-minute break here. It's going to be back where we had breakfast in the main ballroom, which is around the corner. So head over there for Governor Walker's comments. But before you leave, please join me once again in thanking our panelists, State Treasurer Davidson and Senator Brown. We're dismissed. Thank you. 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 Thank